I mean, one of the nice things about teaching is that once the door is closed in your classroom, you can sort of do whatever you want. I mean, there's a reason, but you can experiment and nobody, nobody's going to die. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Novelties, the life of a teacher researcher. Today it is a very special day because I am interviewing my idol in the English language teaching world. He is a teacher, a teacher educator. He is the series editor of the Cambridge Handbooks for Teachers. He is also the co-founder of the Dogme movement and has won several awards for books that he published on both methodology and language. With me today is... Scott, Scott Farnbury. <laughs> Welcome, thank you for being here, Scott. That's great, what a build up to it. Thank oh, you. Oh yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my first question for you, Scott, um, is basically about the IELTEFL conference last year, uh -huh. where you mentioned that teachers don't read research, and that caused a lot of uh, Sharp yes. intake of breath, yes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> why, why by the researchers and by some, uh, by some teachers. I think less, teachers were less surprised by my saying that than the researchers perhaps, but um, it's well documented. Uh, there have been a number of studies on the degree to which teachers, the amount of research they, they read, the degree to which they engage with it, etc. There's all sorts of very good reasons why they don't. Um, one uh, mostly pragmatic, like they don't have the time, they don't have the access actually. I mean, right. uh, where do you, you know, unless you belong to a university, it's very difficult to get your hands on some of these journals that publish the research. Uh, so they really are dependent on those people who can sort of mediate or deliver or filter the research for them into books on methodology, for example, handbooks uh, or whatever. And so that was my particular interest at IATEFL, was looking at the handbooks, the methodology books, talking to the writers of these books, because they, they occupy a very important and privileged position as these kind of bridge builders right. between the researchers on the one hand and the practitioners on the other. Because if we accept that the teachers don't read the research for all the reasons that I've given, plus a lot more, uh, then uh, who is telling them about what's going on in the kind of research field and it's these people who write these often best-selling methodology texts which are often the core texts on teacher training courses uh, they really have a very, a very important responsibility and that's what I was kind of looking at. Because what do you think we could actually do in order to make teachers read research? It's just, I don't think we can. Right. Uh, all we can do is the people who are involved in the mediation process, either the writers of books or teacher educators or whatever, is cherry pick from the research to find those particular studies which we think are suggestive at best and maybe, you know, well, maybe even better than, than may actually have uh, important implications on what we do. But you see, I, I read a lot of research and I must admit, very little, little of it speaks to me as saying, or suggests to me, wow, this is really important, this is going to change the way I teach, or this is the way I talk about teaching. Right. Uh, more often it's like, yeah, okay, yeah, that validates what I sort of already knew from other studies or from my own experience. Right. Which is good, I mean, it's good to have validation, but you know, your average teacher gets validation. Yeah. If they're being vaguely reflective and thinking about what they're doing. They get their validation from their students. They get their validation from their peers. They don't need to go to TESOL quarterly or apply linguistics or language teaching, etc., to find validation for what they're doing or to look for ways of changing what they're doing necessarily. Sure. No, that, that makes so, sense. I mean, I'm, I'm not knocking research. I'm just saying that, well, this, there is a bridge there. And I don't think we should just blame either the teachers on the one hand or the researchers on the other. They're two different, very different disciplines. Yeah. And I think, again, another one of the problems with the research is that it's very much focused often on second language acquisition, uh, with ignoring kind of broader, I mean, second language acquisition, of course, is what we're involved in. We're teaching people how to learn or acquire second languages, yeah. but not in isolation. We're, we're doing it in classrooms, and there sure. needs to be more research what goes on in classrooms. Yeah. And there needs to be more research, it's 
made available to teachers about education generally. I think this is one of the big blind spots in our field. It's too focused on just language teaching. Yeah. But there's very important implications about how people learn, how do adults learn, how do adults learn in groups, anything. And that's what we need to be looking at, the research about education, I think, more than just what's going on in the mind of the language learner. No, that makes sense as well. That makes sense. I also think uh, the idea of what you said, that teachers actually get a direct feedback from the students in itself, and that they can think about this, but um, I think that teachers can also grow mm -hmm. by actually reflecting on their practice, mm -hmm. on their practice mm -hmm. but also in an informed way, so yeah. actually falling back on research. Mm -hmm. Not by seeing it as the absolute truth, as you said, but well, as something well, that you can... Exactly. I think teachers need to, and this is perhaps a responsibility of teacher trainers and supervisors, etc. They need to realize that what they're doing in the classroom is research right. of a kind. Right. As long as they think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And then as long as they sort of mm, attempt little interventions, it's a kind of research. Uh, it may not be the research that gets written up in magazines and journals, etc., but it's the research that matters to them. And one of the nice things about teaching is that once the door is closed in your classroom, you can sort of do whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, no. there's a reason, but yeah. you can experiment and nobody, nobody's going to die. No. no. You know, just because you decided you, know, you were going to have more reading aloud or not reading aloud right. or standing on their heads or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes it's quite good just to go in. And I remember. When I think of my own experience, the kind of um, the real learning moments were often those where I said, "Ah, today I just want to do it differently. I'm just going to go in and not say anything for half an hour, and just you know, see what happens." Or I'm going to um, I'm going to not ask any display questions. I'm going to ask only real questions and see what happens. And it's like, wow, that's, that was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Was that basically how you started as well when teaching? Did you already? start to reflect on your practice? Really? I think I think actually the best thing for my teaching was watching other teachers and that's that's when I suddenly realized oh my god there is many different ways of teaching as there are teachers in the world and yeah. uh, yeah. and you could learn just from watching other teachers how experience they are and wow that's interesting and I mean I remember some lessons I watched I thought they broke all the rules of how I'd been trained but at the same time they seemed to work I mean the students were engaged we don't know if they're learning you know you need to track them over time, but they were engaged, and engagement is like 90% of the battle. They were sitting on the edge of their seats and thinking, wow, there must be something in that, even if it's breaking all the rules. And that was just coming from watching other, other teachers. But then again, at the same time, when you were teaching, I bet in, in the beginning as well, because at least that, that's what happened to me in the beginning, um, that I saw that things were working, and I found that great to see, yeah. obviously, that there's student engagement, they try to express themselves in the way that they want to. Mm. But then again, I also thought, okay, but I could not really put my finger on it on why mm -hmm. exactly this was happening. Mm -hmm. I could come up with ideas mm -hmm. on what it could be, mm -hmm. maybe. Well, this is, why, this is why then it's good to have the references, the, the books, if not the original research papers, but to go back to them and say, well, look, yeah, I was doing something with the way I was giving corrective feedback, for example, that was sort of different, but it seemed to be working. So let's have a look at what they say about corrective feedback. Sure. And then that can start a kind of cycle of, of, of experimentation, reflection, and so on. Actually, I think the people who benefit most from research are the researchers, because it makes them kind of reevaluate their practice. Right. And, uh, at, you know, looking at anything, through a kind of lens is always good and as practicing teachers don't often get the chance it's you know they're doing teaching 30 hours a week or whatever it's very difficult to sort of step back but there are ways that you can do that without being it being too disruptive on your on your routine sure. uh, simply being observed and talking about it with the observer for example is, and, and non evaluative observer is very good practice recording lessons videoing lessons etc okay. is like yeah can be as much as you need it takes to say wow I need to kind of rethink that yeah I totally agree I think Borg mentions this as well this whole idea of continuously trying to reflect on mm -hmm. our practice mm -hmm. and taking it a step further and mm -hmm. then trying to become mm -hmm. professionals as teachers mm -hmm. in our own ways but then there are also people I think it was Hattie as well who mentioned that now basically only researchers can be researchers and mm -hmm. there's no space whatsoever for teachers no. to be researchers 
Yeah, I'm not so sure, actually. I think we, we needn't get too precious about our research, either. Um, I think, as I say, uh, it's getting to the stage where there's almost, there are more re researchers than teachers. Yeah, that's so true. I totally agree. And you can't keep up with it for a start. Well, that's just another reason why it's important that there are people who kind of like filter this, all the stuff that's coming through, all this research noise, and say, look, this might be interesting, right. that might be interesting. As one of my informants mentioned, quoting Prabhu's notion of a sense of plausibility, that teachers need to find a methodology or pedagogy which is plausible to them, which will be, uh, and that plausibility of it will not be simply because it's grounded in research only. It's nice if it is, perhaps, but it's going to be grounded in also the local conditions, their own beliefs and values. Um, their experience, the experience of their uh, colleagues and not least the responses of their learners. There's no point in trying something out on a class of students just because the research says it's going to work and the students don't buy it. Yeah. That's yeah. your ultimate responsibility. Yeah. And so, this is, so these methodology writers, I think, always, were always a rather circumspect, if you like, not skeptical of the research, but saying, well, you know, take it or leave it, but you have to, you have to evaluate it through the, or the lens of your sense of plausibility, which is, as I say, based on all these different factors which are not necessarily scientific. And I think, as before I said, I mean, one of the advantages of teaching is that you shut the door and you can get on with it. But one of the disadvantages of teaching is that because of that, it can be a rather lonely profession. It's one of the few professions, when you think about it, that people do without benefit of their peer observation, for example. You know, a yeah. surgeon has always got people around while they're doing surgery. So an attorney has always got people or other attorneys around. And so, but the teacher's kind of on their own, except unless they have, they work in an institution where there is, there is a lot of you know, sharing and discussing. That, 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 that really, that's the other thing I think that helped me as a teacher. I was lucky, like, I was nurtured in my initial organizations through a very, very fertile and active uh, community of like-minded practitioners. So we talked about what we were doing. And I think that's as important, as important, if not more important, than reading the latest research paper in mean, private wisdoms. Yeah, yeah. So then we come basically to the conclusion of trying to look for ways of collaborative practices, teachers trying to learn from another, mm -hmm. teachers trying to learn from researchers, researchers trying to learn from teachers, mm -hmm. the role being the importance of mm -hmm. mediators as well in there. And so that is going to be the question of the week. How exactly do we get involved in these collaborative practices and how can we actually carry them out? Leave a comment on Facebook, Novelty's Vlog, on Instagram, at The Teacher Researcher, on the YouTube channel, The Teacher Researcher, and on Twitter, Dirk Laagwaard. Have a great week, everybody. I would like to thank, once again, Scott Thornbury for his participation. It has been both a true honor and a pleasure. And remember, guys, once again, that a great teacher never stops learning. Cheers. Thank you.